Hello everyone. Good day. I am Subhashini D from India and I welcome you all to my case presentation. Before I begin, I express my gratitude to VCCA 2024 for this wonderful opportunity. My presentation is divided into three prominent sections. The case report where I will be speaking about our observations followed by the discussion where I correlate our observations with available evidences and finally conclusion where I share the takeaways. We had a 22 year old female walk in on August 2020 with the concerns of reduced hearing in the right ear since a year with gradual reduction and a history of automycosis. She experienced itching, blocking and high pitched tinnitus as well. Also to note she was slightly obese. On otoscopy, her left ear had tall tympanic membrane and right ear tympanic membrane was unvisualized, although the ear canal was dry. We proceeded with the pure tonodogram, which showed normal hearing in the left ear and a moderate mixed loss in the right ear. Emittance revealed C type tympanogram in the right ear and A type tympanogram in the left ear. Acoustic reflexes were present only for left ipsilateral stimulation, consistent for a unilateral mixed loss. As this was a straightforward scenario, we proceeded with diagnosing the patient and referring for an autologist intervention where he diagnosed her with CSOM, she was advised to get treated and follow up. Now fast forward to two years later, she comes back to us on November 2022 complaining of hearing difficulty in the right ear even after resolution of CSOM and also reported of objective vertigo lasting only for few seconds, pulsatile tinnitus and headache. Otoscopy was unremarkable on both sides. However, we were in for a shock when her right ear showed a severe loss with an airborne gap and left ear continued to be normal. Bilateral ATAP tympanograms were noted with acoustic reflexes present for left ipsilateral and right contralateral stimulations consistent with the sensory neural type. However, when you look back at the audiogram, you see a mixed type of loss in the right ear which shouldn't have a diagonal pattern of reflex. Based on these preliminary findings and our concerns of tinnitus, vertigo, and unilateral loss with airborne gap, the otologist suspected venous disease. But we felt something wasn't right and could not stop but wonder if it was truly menius disease. If it was, then the tinnitus would not be pulsatile but rather a continuous one. Vertigo she experienced was of short duration lasting up to only a few seconds whereas in menius disease it would last for longer durations and finally she did not report of any fluctuation in hearing. All these inconsistencies pushed us to investigate further keeping aside the menius disease suspicion. And rightly, OEEs were present. This is the TEOEs, you can clearly see they are present. And this is the DPOEs, which are present as well. Looking back at this audiogram, whether there is an airborne gap or not, it's unnatural to have OEEs present for this degree of loss and definitely not menius disease. So, this was one of our initial signs to understand that this is not menius disease. We proceeded with performing a site of lesion testing using clicks at high and low stimulation rates where no abnormalities in terms of absolute and interpic latencies were found for the left ear. But for the right ear, as you can see, we just got the first peak alone. Contralateral ABR findings for the left ear was normal, whereas for the right ear, we did not get any recordings for the contralateral condition, while ipsilateral recordings again showed only the presence of initial peaks. Now, when we keep in mind the ABR results and look back at the audiogram, a complete absent recording or presence of peak 5 at high intensity would have made much more sense for this degree of loss. But to our surprise, we only got initial peaks. So, this was our second sign that this is something else. To address our vertigo concerns, we did BAMPs. As you can see, there is a clear difference in amplitudes between right and left ear with amplitude asymmetry ratios being abnormal for both frequencies tested, that is 500 Hz and 1000 Hz. OVMs were surprisingly present in the right ear and absent in the left ear. During the video head impulse test, while turning the head to the right, the VOR gains of left anterior and right posterior canals were lower than 1.0 and we observed saccades as well indicating central compensation. So finally, when we were at crossroads as to what direction do we take, our test findings helped us to firmly believe that this is not venous disease and to take up the road considering a central pathology. Our diagnosis was severe hearing loss in the right ear, possibly due to retrocochlear pathology or central pathology, left ear, hearing sensitivity within normal limits. She was advised to go for a neurologist opinion, radiological investigation and follow up. She got back to us with her imaging results which ruled out any lesion at 8th cranial nerve or CP angle. Finally, based on the imaging reports and clinical correlation, she was diagnosed as having idiopathic intracranial hypertension. She was immediately put on medication Trental which is a vasoactive drug. Seven days post medication she followed up when her PTA was still severe but PTA reduced from 80 to 73. She was advised to continue with the medication. And five months later she returned to us for her last follow up and the PTA in the right ear was 53.3 showing drastic improvement in 
So we diagnosed her as having moderate sensory neural hearing loss in the right ear and normal in hearing in the left ear. She was advised to continue with the medications, seek a neurologist opinion and periodically follow up with us. So after the initial diagnosis of RCP in the right ear, she was introduced with Trental and subsequently hearing improved in the right ear with the last visit even marking complete disappearance of tinnitus percept. Moving on to the discussion. To understand the pathogenesis and its affinity to hearing, I used PubMed to get access to 45 articles between the years 1985 to 2024. To begin with, we understand that IIH is a disorder of elevated cerebrospinal fluid pressure of unknown and as I dug deeper, I could see a lot of information which was upfront even during case history taking which could have helped us suspect this condition. Like although the incidence of IIH is 0 0.9 per 100,000 persons, it's more common in women aged 15 to 44 years and the risk increases due to obesity which is true in our patient's case. When we look at the symptom profile, she reported having 4 out of 6 symptoms listed here which are headache, pulsatile tinnitus, hearing loss and vertigo. However, the most common symptoms reported with IIH are transient visual obscuration and diplopia which she did not have surprisingly. The reason for hearing loss in this condition is because of the high intracranial pressure affecting the inner ear labyrinth. The reason for abnormal ABRs is because of the cochlear nerve undergoing compression because of this intracranial pressure. Dural venous sinuses also get affected because of which pulsatile tinnitus occurs. In our patient, CVMs were present. However, in the literature, CVMs are reported to be absent. This could be because the effect of the intracranial pressure might not have spread greatly on the vestibular portion of the auditory nerve. Now here comes the most solid evidence. Her imaging findings had some telltale signs of Dandy's criteria which is used to diagnose IIH. Those are partially empty cella and no other structural lesions. Although abducens palsy which results in diplopia and other visual issues is one of the most prominent signs of IIH that was not present in our patient. Instead, optic nerve distension was noted which is reported in quite a number of studies on IIH as well as stating that excess pressure can harm them. To conclude, this was a valuable learning experience for me and I wanted to share it with the fraternity. Although quite a number of literature evidence is found, it's not every day we encounter such pathologies. So the takeaways here are to never take unilateral losses lightly. If it's asymmetrical, becoming a skeptic is best. The next would be to emphasize on follow-up as we could unveil this problem in her only because of follow-up and during the initial visit, the symptoms of infection could have masked this underlying pathology which could have been in a gradual developing pattern. The next would be to believe that the patient knows best and have a mindful and vigilant case history taking session as most of the telltale signs of IIH was already there in the case history and a vigilant eye could have spotted it. The last takeaway would be to always go by the cross check principle as it can help in getting closer to the diagnosis by ruling out other conditions just like in our patient how we ruled out Menia's disease. These are some of my references. Thank you all. I would be happy to take up any questions if any.